Okay. So yesterday we left off, we had talked about Kepler's three laws, his law of elliptical orbits, his law of equal areas, okay, which kind of prove each other, uh, and then the law of periods, which was the one that basically proved everything had to orbit the sun or there wouldn't be this Kepler constant that is true for any two bodies orbiting the same central point, okay? Uh, sorry, so if we've got, um, let's say, the period of Earth squared over the radius of Earth's orbit cubed, that Num whatever that number comes out to, that's the same number it'll come out to for any other object that orbits the sun. All right, everything that orbits the sun has the same Kepler constant. So if that's true, then I should be able to set this equal to that same formula for any other planet in our solar system, agreed? Okay, so that's what I'm gonna do for this problem right here, okay? So they're saying that Mars has an orbital radius of 1.52 astronomical units, that's what AU stands for, okay? One astronomical unit is the distance from the center of the sun to the center of the earth. It's 1.50 times 10 to the 11 meters, okay? The nice thing about Kepler's law of periods is you can use any units you want, okay? You don't, you're not stuck with seconds for period, meters for radius, and things like that, because obviously when we're dealing with how far it is from the center of the earth to the center of the sun, okay, that's a big number when it's in meters. Okay, when it's in astronomical units, it's one. Okay, and that's a lot easier to put into a formula than 1.5 times 10 to the 11. Okay, so the advantage of Kepler's law of periods is smaller numbers. Okay, that's the advantage. The disadvantage of Kepler's constant is it can only calculate two things, radius and period. Okay, it can't calculate speed, it can't do any of that stuff. Okay, uh, the other disadvantage is I can only use it for objects that have the same orbital center. Okay, if they don't have the same orbital center, it doesn't work. So I can't use this uh, with like the moon and Jupiter because they don't have the same central point. Okay, it doesn't work unless they orbit the same thing. All right, so I'm going to set this up so that I've got the period of Earth squared, okay, um, is equal, uh, sorry, over the radius of Earth's orbit cubed is equal to the same thing for Mars. Okay, they told me the radius of Mars's orbit. Michael, sorry. Yes. No, it should be the same for anything orbiting the sun. I mean, there's going to be exceptions for like things that have freakishly weird orbits, but I mean, it should, it should hold true. Yeah. Okay. So I've got these things here. Okay. And I know the radius of Mars. I know the radius of Earth's orbit and I know the period of Earth's orbit. How long is Earth's orbital period around the sun? 365 and one quarter days. Don't forget, we have a leap year every four years to make up for the fact that it's actually 365 and a quarter days. But we're not going to use days. We're going to use years because it's a smaller number. It's how many years? One. Okay. See how easy this is going to be? We're going to have one squared over one cubed, which will be one. Sweet. Okay. So that's where we're headed. We're trying to find the period of Mars's orbit. And we're going to find that in years since they didn't specify that it had to be in any other units. Okay. So to manipulate for this, I'm going to multiply both sides by the radius of Mars's orbit cubed. Okay. That gives me the period of Mars's orbit squared. So what do I have to do over here? I want the period of Mars's orbit, not the period of Mars's orbit squared square root, right? Okay, so I all I have to do with this formula is cross multiply and either square root or if I'm looking for one of the radii, cube root. Okay, there's really not a lot of algebra in this one. So when I plug in my numbers, they told me that the radius of Mars's orbit was 1.52 astronomical units. So I'm gonna take that cubed and I'm gonna multiply it by the period of Earth's orbit squared. One, okay, and I'm going to divide that by the radius of Earth's orbit, one astronomical unit. Okay, so what I end up with is the square root of 1.52 cubed. Agreed? Because I'm just multiplying 1.52 by one and then dividing it by one still. Okay. All right, so if I want to put that into my calculator, okay, I'm going to have the square root of 1.52 and then you have to use math. Math is okay, in here in three. Okay, it'll get me cubed. All right, so one year on Mars is 1.84 Earth years. 
that means you would have a birthday just a little more than half as often. So if birthdays are a big deal to you, don't go to Mars. You won't get them as often. Okay. Then everyone follow kind of what we did there. All right, so 1.84. A stands for annum. That's the abbreviation for years. Okay. All right. I want you guys to try these ones. They work exactly the same way. All right. So uh, we're trying to use Kepler's law of period again to determine the orbital period of Jupiter. So anytime we use Kepler's law of periods for something in our solar system, planet one is always going to be what? What planet do we always know the orbital radius and orbital period of? Earth. So we always use Earth as the first one. Okay. So we're going to have the period of Earth squared over the radius of Earth's orbit cubed, and we're going to set that equal to the other body that we're dealing with because we always know Earth's numbers. Okay. In, the other, in this case, the one we're trying to find is Jupiter. Okay, And they tell us its orbital radius is 5.203 astronomical units, so it's over five times as far from the sun as Earth is. All right, we're looking for the period of Jupiter, so we're going to multiply both sides by the radius of Jupiter's orbit cubed, and then take the square root of that to get the period of Jupiter. So what we'll have is 5.203 cubed, the radius of Jupiter's orbit, okay, times one squared, one year, that's Earth's orbital period, divided by one astronomical unit cubed. All right, so it sets up exactly like the Mars one did. So the period of Jupiter's orbit should be 11.87 annum, or Earth years. Okay. Everybody all right with that? Yeah? Okay. Keep going on uh, two and three here. All right, so in number two, they tell us that Pluto takes 90,553 Earth days to orbit the sun. So what do I need to put Earth's orbital period in this time? Days. It's got a match. I can't use years and days. It doesn't, doesn't work out. All right, so I know I have to use the Earth's orbital period in days. Okay, we We're using uh, this value to determine its mean orbital radius. So we're looking for Pluto's orbital radius. How far is it from the sun? Okay, um, doesn't tell us what units. So we should use astronomical units because the number will be nice and small then. Okay, we don't use meters because then we're going to get some giant number. Okay, so we're going to set it up again. Period of Earth squared over the radius of Earth's orbit cubed equals the period of Pluto squared divided by the radius of Pluto's orbit cubed. All right, this time we're looking for the radius of Pluto's orbit. Okay, it's on the bottom right now. I don't want to solve for it on the bottom. Okay, so what I do is I just flip both sides. Okay, so I got radius of Earth's orbit cubed, period of Earth's orbit squared. Okay, and then I just moved the period of Pluto's orbit squared over to here. Okay, so now I'm solving for the radius of Pluto's orbit cubed. I just want the radius of Pluto's orbit, so I have to cube root. Okay, not square root, I got a cube root. All right, so when I put in my numbers here, that's going to be uh, 90,553 squared right, times 1 cubed divided by, uh, sorry, not 1, 365 and a quarter squared. Okay, and then I'm going to cube root that. All right, so now I'm going to cube root my answer. So I just went into math. Okay, I hit the math button, and then I hit 4. 4 gives me the cube root. All right, so Pluto is 39.5 astronomical units. Well, actually, we have four significant figures here, I think. So 39.46 astronomical units from the sun. It's almost 40 times further away from the sun than Earth is. Okay. 
Everybody all right with that? Okay, how many people have done number three? All right, I'll give you a couple more minutes on number three, and then we'll do that one together too. <clears throat> all right, so last one here. Okay, we're looking at um, trying to find the orbital period of a piece of rocky debris that has a mean orbital radius of 45 astronomical units. Okay, so again, we want to set this equal to Earth. So we got the period, whoop, period of Earth squared over the radius of Earth's orbit cubed equals the period of the rocky debris, okay, squared over the radius of the rocky debris's orbit cubed. And here's the key thing, guys, because I see people make this mistake all the time. Instead of using the Earth's orbital radius, they use the Earth's radius. Is that going to interfere with your answer? A great deal, as the Earth's radius is exponentially smaller than the Earth's orbital radius. Okay, um, so just make sure you're being aware of that when you're using it. Okay, so we're looking for the period of its orbit. So we're just going to multiply both sides by the radius of the rocky debris orbit cubed, and then we're going to square root it all. Okay, so we will have uh, 45 cubed times 1 squared divided by 1 cubed. Okay, so really we just have the square root of 45 cubed. All right, so 302 Earth years for it to go around the sun. So you wouldn't see your first birthday at all. <laughs> okay. All right, um, questions there? That law of periods makes sense? If it doesn't make sense, in the end, it's not something you ever have to use because, I mean, it's a shortcut. It's kind of a quicker calculation if you have the right givens. Okay. But anytime you have something orbiting something else, you can always set it up with what we're going to talk about today, which is centripetal force is provided by the force of gravity. Okay, That will always work for any body orbiting another. Kepler's law works in certain situations. This always works. Okay, The downfall to this one is the units I have to use make all my numbers giant okay and there's just no way around that now one thing we are going to have to do often when we're doing satellite motion problems is that we're going to need the orbital period in the formula somewhere okay and or and period isn't in this formula right now but have we done something where we were able to substitute and get period in here Everyone should be nodding yes, because we have, okay? The formula for V is two pi R over T, right? If I want to substitute that in for V, which we've done before, what do I have to do to this formula? Square it, because V is squared in here, all right? So I'm going to have four times pi squared times R squared over T squared, and I'm just going to plug that in for V. Okay, so 4 pi squared, r squared, t squared on the bottom. This r and this r cancel each other off. Okay, I just substitute it right in there. All right, you are going to have to be able to do that for certain questions that we could run into. All right, now again, as I said, the drawback here is I can't use years for period. It's going to have to be in seconds here. Why does it have to be in seconds here? What did I set equal to each other? What's the units for force? Newtons. And a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. Okay, So your radius has to be in meters, and your period has to be in seconds squared, or you're not setting Newtons equal to Newtons. Because I've got an R squared on the top and an R on the bottom. Right, there's still an R. That, I left the R. Yeah, I just took the squared off, so that R, R on the bottom is gone. Yeah. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at here next. Okay, so um, the thing we need to know about satellites is that they still obey uniform circular motion laws. Artificial or natural, they still have to obey, okay, they have to undergo uniform circular motion. That is, their velocity remains constant, sorry, 
the magnitude of their velocity remains constant as they move in their orbit around the object they're orbiting. Okay. Um, it is the force of gravity that provides the centripetal force. That's why we just showed you Fc equals Fg, but it's big Fg this time, not m times g. It's Newton's universal law of gravitation. Okay. And any orbit is achieved by making sure a body travels far enough that the distance it falls towards the thing it's orbiting is equal to the amount that object curved away. Okay. The Earth is round. We've covered that. The Earth is round. I saw this meme actually yesterday. That was really funny. Um, what was it? it was sun round, moon round, stars round, Earth giant frisbee flying through space. Makes no sense. Yeah. Okay, so the Earth's round. Wow. Okay. So they don't take into account that whole picture of the Earth from the moon thing. Oh, OK. It's interesting how people can pick and choose what stuff is factual and what isn't. <laughs> That's why I like that one. All around the globe. You mean all around the Frisbee or like saucer? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for proving the idiocy of your own argument. OK, um, right. So here's, here's Newton's idea. Newton, in his, later in his career, got to the point where he was so widely respected that he didn't even have to do any real experiments anymore. Okay? He started doing thought experiments, okay? where he just thought stuff up and said, hey, wouldn't this be cool? We're not going to do it because it'll work. I'm Newton, remember? Okay, like that's kind of the, to the point he got to. So Newton's idea was he could make something orbit the Earth. He just had to make it go fast enough. So if he could take like a cannon, well, not him, he would get you know some of his underlings to do it, carry it up to the top of a very tall mountain, all right, and fired the cannon, he could make the cannonball orbit the Earth. Sounds reasonable, right? except that a cannonball could never go fast enough in order to do that, okay? But that's fine. It was just a thought experiment. He wasn't really going to do it, okay? But it was the right idea, okay? What he said is, if something orbits the Earth, it's always falling. But if it can go fast enough, the distance the Earth curves away because the Earth is round will be equal to the distance that the cannonball or satellite falls. That means it never gets any closer to the Earth. Even though it's always falling, it never gets any closer. It just has to go fast enough. This was the problem. It had to travel eight kilometers in one second in order for this to work. And of course, at the time Newton was around, that was, in, that was impossible. Okay? There was no cannon powerful enough to make a cannonball go that fast. Right? There's other flaws to this experiment, obviously. Um, even if you could make the cannonball go that fast, you better get off the mountain because it's going to come back, okay? Come all the way around and take you out, right? So you fire the cannonball and then everybody quickly climbs back down and watches, right? Um, the other flaw would be, unless you're on Mount Everest, it could probably still hit something, okay? And there's no way anyone's lugging a cannon to the top of Mount Everest. They won't even bring people back down when they get tired or cold or sick. Okay, they just leave them up there. It's true. Okay, um, so yeah, they're not they're not carrying a cannon up to the top. So it's just a thought experiment. Okay, uh, but the idea is correct. Okay, every second that something is in the air, okay, or the first second, sorry, that it's in the air, it's going to fall 4.9 meters, half of 9.81. Okay. Um, if it doesn't get any closer to the Earth, then that distance isn't going to increase every second. It's going to be the same every second. Okay? Every second is going to try and fall that far. But as long as it's going fast enough, the Earth will curve away that much. To make the Earth curve away 4.9 meters, it has to travel just a little over 8 kilometers in one second. Well, you can't make something do that within the Earth's atmosphere. Okay? What happens to meteors and things like that when they hit the Earth's atmosphere? They burn up, okay, due to friction, right? There's a lot of friction in the air, and you try to make anything move that fast, and it'll just burn up, 
Okay, there'll be so much heat generated that okay, they won't be able to do it. They have the same problem with the space shuttle and stuff. Okay, when those things come back in, well, not the space shuttle anymore. Okay, but when they come back into the Earth's atmosphere, they have to have a heat shield. And when they finally land on the ground, no one can come up to them for a while, or they have to cool them down. Okay, because they're really, really hot. Right? Even some uh, fighter aircraft. Uh, well, the, the SR-71 Blackbird. Okay, the, the surveillance plane that can go really, really fast. When that lands after having gone close to its maximum speed, no one can touch it for a while. Okay? It's just really, really hot from all the friction. So we can't make something do this within the Earth's atmosphere. So the real challenge to getting something to go that fast was also to get it high enough that it was outside the Earth's atmosphere where friction wouldn't be a factor. That's where the space race began. Right? So who was the first country to get something to orbit the Earth? Russia. Yeah. Okay, the Soviet Union, actually, okay, were the first to get something into space. Sputnik. A little satellite shaped like a basketball with antennas coming off the back. Okay, um, Terrified everybody. People were easily frightened okay, back then. It was the Cold War. Right? So when they got something to orbit the Earth, everyone immediately thought, OK, they got a little basketball with antennas to orbit the Earth. They could get a bomb to orbit the Earth, and then it would fall on us. That was the Cold War thinking. Okay? And so everyone was very frightened. So the, the Americans had to get something into orbit to prove, hey, don't do it, because we can do it too. Right? What was that called? Anyone remember from social class? MAD. Mutually assured destruction. That's what kept the Cold War from getting hot. They both knew if one of them pushed the button, the other would push the button, and everybody would die. Mutually assured destruction. Okay. This was like the thinking of the 60s to the 80s. You're lucky you didn't live during that time. Okay. All right. Uh, so this is the idea. Any satellite is really just a projectile that's very high up and moving very fast. So fast that its arc actually becomes a circle. All right. So this was Newton's kind of other idea here. He said, if if I could get up on top of the of a very high mountain or perch or whatever, okay, and I could hit if I hit something, it would follow a projectile arc. If I hit it faster, it would follow this projectile arc. Faster, fast enough. Boom, it'll orbit the, boom. It'll orbit the Earth, okay? According to the laws of projectile motion and circular motion, okay? So really, the reason that Chris Hedfield is weightless on the International Space Station is he's not weightless. He's apparently weightless. He's always falling, right? He just never gets any closer to the Earth. All right, so. In order to figure this out, okay, we have to say that the force of gravity is providing our centripetal force. Okay? If we can figure that, if we can accept that, then satellite motion becomes possible. There's just a certain speed that has to be achieved for a certain radius. Okay? The closer you are, the basically kind of the faster you have to go because gravity will be stronger. Okay? You just get further away, gravity becomes weaker, and you don't have to go quite as fast. Okay? So out and out you go. If you want to like escape Earth, you have to achieve escape velocity. That is, you have to go faster than the orbital speed for whatever radius you're at. And then you'll shoot off on a tangential kind of path and head off to where you want to go. Okay? All right. Um, so if we wanted to solve for V, and we did this the other day when we solved for how fast the moon is going, okay, we simply manipulate this formula to get V by itself. So we multiply both sides by R. Okay, R, The R will move over here and cancel off the square. We'll divide both sides by M. Which M is going to cancel, the Earth or the satellite? Which one's going to be on both sides? Because we've got an M here and an M here. Which one's going to be on both sides? Earth or the satellite? The satellite. Yeah, the satellite has to be on both sides because the satellite is the thing moving in the circle, right? Whatever mass is moving in the circle is the one that's on this side, okay? That's the one that has to cancel. Earth's not moving in a circle around itself, okay? Right, they're very far away, actually. Geosynchronous orbit is very, very high. Right, because what's an or what's the orbital period have to be if you're going to be over the same spot on Earth all the time, one day? Yeah, right. So you have to be a lot further away. The International Space Station they get 18 sunrises and sunsets every day. 
okay? Because they're in low Earth orbit, so they're whipping around, like, like was it every three hours or something like that, they go around and around. So yeah, they, they go around often quickly because they're so much lower. Okay, um, so let's have a look at, um, so if we want to find the period of a satellite, this is what we were talking about before, okay? Then we have to substitute in for V, two pi r, over t, okay, and we did that just a minute ago, okay, and we found that the formula reverts from this to this, okay, because instead of having v, I've got 4 pi squared r squared over t squared, okay, and it makes it this one here. All right, so you can see on this diagram, Michael, that's what you were just asking, okay, low earth orbit or polar orbits, okay, are not nearly as wide as the geosynchronous orbits. All right, so let's, um, let's actually figure that out right now. Okay, write this question down. We'll do it as an example. Okay, how far from the Earth's surface is a geosynchronous satellite? Okay, where do we usually measure radius from? To the center. So what am I going to be solving for first? I'll have an extra step here. What am I going to have to solve for? Well, I'm not going to solve for the radius of Earth because I know what that is, but I will have to subtract the radius of the Earth from the orbital radius, okay? I can only solve for the orbital radius, which is center to center. Then I'll subtract the radius. This is a very, very common trick okay, in a satellite motion question is to say, what's the altitude, height, or how high above the surface is it, okay? Then it's just trying to catch you on a technicality, right? We know that radius is always measured center to center. So if it says anything about surface or altitude or height, then you'll have to subtract the radius. All right, so anyway, we want to set this up where we have gravity equal to the centripetal force. And we're going to use the one that has period in it because we don't have speed here, right? We only know that the satellite is geosynchronous. So m times 4 pi squared r over t squared. Okay, so I'm solving for r. I need to know the radius of the orbit here so that I can figure out how far above the surface. So I'm going to move r squared over here. So what am I going to have over here? What's r squared times r? r cubed. Okay. All right, so I've got r cubed over there. And now I want to get r cubed by itself. So I'm going to multiply both sides by t squared. And then I'm going to divide both sides by m times 4 times pi squared. All right, what happens to the mass of the satellite? It cancels off. There's one on the top and there's one on the bottom. All right, so that's going to give me r cubed. What am I still going to have to do here is my last step. Cube root this. Okay. So, yeah, there's a lot of, like, finicky algebra here. Okay. All right, now... A geosynchronous satellite's orbital period is how long? Something stays over the same spot on Earth all the time. Its orbital period is one day, 24 hours. What do I need it in? Seconds. Yeah, I need it in seconds. So right, to get the orbital period in seconds, I'm going to go 24 times 3,600. Okay, 86,400, right? Okay, so we have an orbital period of 86,400 seconds, okay, and everything else we have. So when I'm plugging in here, plugging in my numbers, okay, I'm going to have 86,400 squared times 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times the mass of the Earth, 5.98 times 10 to the 24. Okay, and then I'm going to divide that by 4 pi squared.
Okay, so I'm getting that the orbital radius is going to be 4.22, actually, I'm only at two significant figures here, 4.2 uh, times 10 to the 7. Yeah. Okay, so 4.2 times 10 to the 7 meters. Now, that's the orbital radius. The question wants to know how far above the surface this is. So what do I need to subtract from this number? The Earth's radius. Okay, I'm going to take that number there okay, and subtract um, 6.37 times 10 to the 6. Wow, I can't believe I forgot that. All right, so my final answer is going to be that the satellite is 3.6 times 10 to the 7 um, meters above the Earth's surface. Okay. That is as hard as the satellite motion question gets. It was the first one I gave you, but that's as hard as they get. That has every trick in it. Okay, it's It gave you no numbers outright. Okay, it gave you no numbers outright. It made you use the substitution in the formula, and it made you subtract the Earth's radius. Okay? It made you do every single thing that a question could possibly do. They're not always that tricky. Yeah. All right. So I want you guys... Um, no, we did that one already. Okay, try and figure out these two. Okay, they're satellite motion questions, but remember, Neptune doesn't orbit the Earth. Okay, think about that when you're figuring out what mass you need to use here. Okay? It kind of gives you the wrong mass if you don't, if you use the Earth. 